assignment for you, if you give me a five minute warning when I'm to finish. Pastors have a hard time, you know, with um, uh, finishing their sermons on time. And uh, one fellow I, I remember hearing about um, heard that you can just put a lo lozenge in your mouth, and when it dissolves fully, it was time for him to wind down. Well, this one time it went on and on and on and on and on and on. And his wife is going like this, and you know, trying to get his attention to stop. And he just kept on going, and he realized he reached in his mouth and he pulled out a button. <laughs> Could have gone out for a long time. <laughs> well, let's pray. Let's center our, our hearts and thoughts on the Lord. And we want to hear from his heart this morning. Give him place. So we give you place. We agree with the prayer of your son that your name, Father, will be hallowed and honored esteemed and cherished and blessed and glorified. And hallowed be thy name means there's no other name. Nothing compares with you. So we want to give place to you, Father. We say that you're a good, good Papa. Jesus called you Abba. Dad. You welcome us into your family. You love us. You go before us, behind us, beside us, above and below. You totally surround us in your love. So what's on your heart, Lord? Is there anything in particular that you want to share with us this morning? So again, there may be a picture, or a scripture, or a song. Something that speaks of Father's heart for us.
I believe the Lord would say, many of you have not recognized who you are and what power is in your life. Turn unto me, and I will show you the power that I've invested in you. Walk in that power. Amen. I have a sense that Heavenly Father wants us to know that the love that he has for his son, Jesus, there's no less love he has for us. He loves us like his son. And we are his sons and daughters. That he cherishes. That he pursues. Always in his mind and heart. We belong to him. This week has been peace, the shalom of God. And um, in my first talk, I, I, I talked about the relationship vertically with God and some of the things that can get in the way. God wants to clear all that stuff out of the way so that we have that intimacy with him, that we know uh, that we're present. And often my prayer is, Lord, I want to have easy access to your embrace. I just put my head on your chest. Yeah and uh, just rest there. But then live out of that place too, out of that place of knowing his tenderness, knowing his love. And that uh, there's no place for shame or guilt or condemnation. And he accepts us, cherishes us, loves us. And then the second talk, I talked about sort of internal stuff that goes on in a big one uh, is, is fear and worry and anxiety uh, that God wants us to give those to Him and that we can walk in peace. Well, I want to talk about, um, so there's that vertical experience with inness of peace and then how our relationships are around us. I want to share a couple of stories of, um, that were really difficult in my life. Um, and how God worked in the middle of that was just quite amazing. The summer before I was to be ordained, my last year of seminary, my bishop um, asked if I would direct a camp. I had never been in a camp before, other than like a sports camp, and, and uh, this was a church camp. And uh, fortunately, God gave me an amazing program director, and, and it was an amazing experience. But when I arrived on the site, it was in really bad shape physically, and there are other issues as well. Uh, for example, to pass the water test, they, they poured a, 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 a whole jug of Javax down the, the well <laughs> to kill all the bugs oh, wow. and stuff. Um, we had outhouses that were called Kaibos, and they were leaching into the swimming area, and the kids were getting sick, and eye infections, ear infections, all sorts of stuff, just really nasty. So Holly had done a degree in, um, in recreation, and so we knew a lot of people in that field, and so I had them come in, several people come in, and just uh, offer an analysis. And I wrote this up for the bishop. Well, the bishop said, well, that should light a fire under them. <laughs> and it sure did. Um, but soon after, we were on our way to, um, to Chicago from Eastern Canada, uh, to do my graduate studies. And I got this letter, hope everything's well with you. And then after that, it was like this total character assassination because what they had decided to do as a camp committee was in order to discredit the report, they did this character assassination of me, just tore me apart. And wow. of course, um, this, uh, the fellow that was the head of the committee uh, was the right hand person to the bishop and really had the bishop's ear. And so I knew that I was in, in trouble. And I was really ticked off. I wanted to tear their faces off. I thought it was a good thing that, you know, I was, you know, hundreds of miles away, a thousand miles away uh, from there, or there would have been 
uh, significant obituary in the, in the newspaper. I was, I was really ripping. And my, my temperament is pretty even keeled, but I wasn't sleeping, I was really upset. And Holly, God bless her, said, you need to forgive those people. And I realized, I didn't know how to do that. You know, I'd grown up in the church, I never really had any teaching and, and, and uh, an understanding of how to forgive people. And uh, uh, we would often just sweep things under the carpet. That's not a good plan. <laughs> and so uh, I began to search this out. And actually, a very dear friend of ours, uh, her husband was murdered by his cousin. And, uh, and she would do these seminars on uh, forgiveness because there was just a lot of upheaval, as you can imagine, in that family with this, uh, this murder like that. And the, the first principle was that it's, it's an act of the will, it's a choice, that we choose to forgive. Even though we may not feel like it, um, it's, it's a, a deliberate choice. At the root of forgiveness is letting go. And that, that's where the sands down is so helpful for me. It just said, uh, I'm going to let this person go. Okay. Well, that's not the end of the story. Uh, when I came back, having felt that I worked through these things, uh, and if you read Matthew 18, it talks about forgiving from the heart, and I had begun that process, and for many people, it is a process of forgiving and releasing, uh, especially with very painful situations. Um, so, uh, we had this thing called Anglican formation. Uh, and uh, we would have different clergy come in and lead the Eucharist. And uh, I was assigned to be the server at the altar. And who was to be the first person? Uh, the guy that had <laughs> chaired the, the camp. And I went, oh no, and I felt all this anger rise up within me again. And it kind of freaked me out because I thought, well, I thought I'd forgiven him. But it was just crazy. Now, part of our liturgy, uh, our worship, is that we have a time of confession, and then there's the assurance of forgiveness, and then we exchange the peace. We speak peace, and we, we generally hug one another and, and that. So uh, I felt all this uh, in the confession, I just sort of said, God, I don't know what's going on. All this is bubbling up inside me. I just give it all to you. And then um, when we came to the time of the peace, uh, Father David turned to me, and he said, peace be with you, John. And I said, and also with you. And deep inside of me, this is what happened. <laughs> it just like popped and it was gone. It was an amazing thing. Uh, when I share this, I, I said, let's practice that. One, two, three. Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> but it was, I, I was free. It was amazing. But it really showed in Matthew 18 about how it talks about forgiving from the heart. And I had come into that place. Now, the, the interesting thing beyond that, uh, I was asked to be on the diocesan committee with Father David. And uh, we had work to do beyond that particular committee meeting. And we agreed to have lunch together. So um, I, he got there first. And when I sat down, he, he was weeping. And I said, David, what's going on? And he said, I don't know how I could, you could have ever forgiven me for what I did to you. And I lost it too. And I said, it was God. You know, God helped me with that. I don't know if you're familiar with Alexander Pope. He was the second most quoted uh, English poet after Shakespeare. And he was the fellow that penned, the error is human to forgive divine. Because you really do need God's help. You know, to forgive. He was a very devout Christian. So uh, that, that was a very important lesson. When I went to my first parish, uh, I should say, David became a, a very close friend. I trust him with my life. And uh, just how God can take a very painful situation and bring reconciliation, just like we heard uh, with you folks. What a wonderful gift for you to share with us. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's the kindness of God in, in really restoring and, and refreshing and making new. Um, when I went to my first parish, there was a fellow that had been a lay reader. This is a person licensed to lead services and read and do different things. He'd been uh, a lay reader for 27 years. And we ended up like this. And uh, um, at one point, he um, 
came up and he threw his uh, offering envelope on the, on the uh, altar and stormed out of the church. And that was the last I saw of him the whole time we were there. But he proceeded to go about saying that I was uh, starting a cult uh, because we had a new uh, worship book and various things like that that we were using. And so uh, I hated the guy's guts. I mean, to be honest, I mean, I was really ticked off with him. How, how dare he do something like that? And uh, he was in a special study uh, where uh, he had a major heart issue. And uh, I think seven out of eight people died during the study. And he's the only one who survived. And I kept saying, well, take him out. <laughs> take him out. I mean, I was really ticked with this guy. Because he was causing a lot of damage. I thought, if he spent as much time sharing the gospel with people as he was trying to tear down you know, what was happening. But the, uh, the other part of the thing was, one of his sons was the parish treasurer, and the other was the parish organist. So I mean, we could have lost the whole family. But the family understood the dynamic with him because I discovered later that he, he fought with every clergy, every priest that came into that parish. And so I was just, <laughs> A lot of one of the fine succession of clergy that he ended up like this with. Oh, wow. But the Lord changed my heart. I began to weep for him as I prayed for him. Mm -hmm. He really began to do a deep work in my heart. And from time to time, I would go and I would I would say, Cliff, I want to ask for forgiveness because clearly there's hurt, and and I want to ask. Uh, and one time in particular, I went at Christmas time. And I said, you know, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. This is a time when we celebrate family, we celebrate, you know, his goodness and his peace and coming in as our Savior. Mm -hmm. and, and again, he, he blew me off. You know? And as I was leaving, I felt the Lord said, you've done everything you can do. Mm -hmm. and, and then I was reminded of St. Paul saying, uh, as far as you're able, uh, live at peace with all people. And uh, I just had the confirmation. I was very careful to honor him uh, and give him place to, because I could have said a, a word or two and just would have trashed him, you know, and because he was really out of line, nastily out of line. And, uh, but the Lord just said, zip it, <laughs> and uh, to give him place and space to do that. Now the irony in this, uh, I finished out the same kind of um, situation when I went to another parish, but we would have concerts, and I thought I'd invite this a group of men, a men's choir from the area in my first parish, and Cliff was in that, was in that group. And uh, we had uh, uh, the concert, it was great, and afterwards we had a reception. And he went around to everybody in that place in our, in our new parish and said, that Rodham was the best priest we ever had. And I thought, well, go figure. <laughs> uh, uh, but I mean, that was, that was the kindness of God. He didn't have to do that, but uh, I realized that I was a threat. He had issues with authority, and um, sadly, and, um, but that was the situation. So that first instance that I shared with you uh, really uh, spoke of, you know, things will happen in our lives that cause us uh, real tensions and, and rifts in relationships. But God can restore those. And, and I, I find that many times people sort of roll along in relationships and if they're rocky roads and if you persevere in working through those things, then um, you're stronger than you really were, could ever be. That even though there's a, a rupture at points, if you work through those things and, and work through forgiveness. So I want to come back to this idea of forgiveness. The first thing I mentioned to you is it's, a, it's a, an act of the will. To, to release people. But there's part of us that we really want to get even, or we want God to do something to, you know, to hammer that person, you know, vengeance. justice, vengeance, you know. And, uh, but remember what the scripture says, vengeance is mine, mine. it's his, his, that's his deal, not mine. And so uh, I discovered a prayer, which has really been helpful with that, in that regard is, Lord, I choose to give this person a gift they don't deserve. They don't deserve to be forgiven. They deserve, in my view, to get whacked. Um, I choose to give this person a gift they don't deserve. I choose to forgive them. You know, the irony is that 
when, when we hold a grudge or we, there's unforgiveness and bitterness in our hearts, we're the ones who suffer. Amen. In fact, the, the Greek word for uh, taking offense is scandalon. That's where we get the word scandal from. And so it's like we're on this meat hook. And so forgiveness lets us off the hook. And it frees us to allow God to heal our hearts because we've been bruised, we've been hurt. And God is in the business of healing hearts to bind up the brokenhearted and to heal us. And so when we let go of this, there's another part of forgiveness. A friend of mine wrote a book on forgiveness and I have, I've not really uh, seen this before. And this is hard when you're in the middle of facing hurts. But uh, when, I, when somebody does something to me, I, I get angry at them. Remember what Jesus said when you have anger in your heart? It's like murder, right? And I thought, oh, ouch. <laughs> and then um, he also um, indicated that, um, you know, he is the judge. And when we, when we criticize or, or we condemn people for hurting us, we're taking the place of God. And so, in many instances, part of the healing process has been for us to say, God, I'm sorry. I've taken over your place. You're the judge, and I'm not. We saw this powerfully in ministry. I'm going to talk about this a bit tomorrow, but um, Holly is uh, part Mi'kmaq, which is an Algonquin native tribe in Eastern Canada. And she's part black. I call her a Heinz 57, which is a little bit of everything. You know, I'm just boring English and German, you know? So, uh, but uh, we've, we've had the privilege of, of ministering um, in, in First Nations communities. In fact, I had the honor um, uh, of be, being welcomed as part of a nation, part of a tribe. Wow. And I'm, I'm now actually a Crow Indian, which I thought was appropriate because I've eaten a lot of Crow in my life. <laughs> and, and, and you are what you eat, right? <laughs> so, but it really was an honor to, to be welcomed and, and received. Um, and part of our, uh, as we engage people of different cultures, and particularly First Nations, um, they want to develop friendships. They don't want to be projects or, or uh, you know, ways of, of engaging people. Uh, this is uh, the gift. And they have a wonderful understanding of covenant and the land and various things. They really understand the beauty of God's of creation. Let me run a little bit of a rant on that for a minute. I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, there was a, a German anthropologist, he was a Roman Catholic priest also, but he went all around Turtle Island, that's the word for North America and the native community, they call it Turtle Island. And he went to most of the major nations or tribes, and he discovered that there was a common root, that they believed in one God, they had prophets and various things, very much like ancient Israel in the Old Testament. And then about a thousand years ago, uh, shamanism came in across the Bering Strait. And, and because of a similar sort of worldview in terms of um, uh, you know, the supernatural and that, that came, but it's a combination of Babylonian and Egyptian religion. You can go to the Midwest and in some of the caves there, it's like walking into a pyramid with Egyptian hieroglyphics. In other places, some of the, some of the things. So, and, and to be candid, a lot of that practice is very, very uh, demonic. The Haida Indian, for example, that built the totem poles on the West Coast, uh, they were very much involved in human sacrifice. And uh, so it's just nasty stuff. So when the Europeans came over, they saw this and went, ah! you know? But uh, I feel that a better strategy is to say, you know, um, shamanism is not native to the native people. That's right. The, the, the original belief system was very much in line with um, the Judeo-Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. But sadly, only about 5% of First Nations people are believers. Mm -hmm. and, and we have a great opportunity wow. to, to, to reach out. So anyway, that's my little commercial uh, on the side. But I'll, I'll be talking about that tomorrow because one of the ramifications of peace is that as we walk in peace, it, we, we bring reconciliation and a broader sphere. Um, uh, Glenn Clark, for example, um, there's a book uh, that you introduced me to, David, um, called Creative Peace. And a, a group of people 
uh, went through all of Glenn Clark's books and the true quotes of his perspective on peace. And it's an amazing little book, and this PDF is on your website. And uh, that's where I discovered it. But uh, Glenn was quite convinced that the ba if you walk in peace, that's the basis of spiritual power, and it's also the basis of, of spiritual reconciliation. And, and so that, that's what I was talking about. But at the, at the root of it, we need to have that place with God strong, and we need to have that place within us strong, we need to have that place in terms of our relationships with others strong. And so, uh, and God gives us the resource to do that. He gives us the capacity to do that. Uh, does anybody have a Bible here? We might turn to Matthew chapter 6, and in that is called the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, uh, Matthew 5 to 7. And in Matthew 6 is the familiar, the, the familiar words of the Lord's Prayer. So I'd like you to read that out if you would, please. And, but, and stay there, because I'm going to get you to read something else from that passage. Matthew 6? Yes. Uh, but look at where the Lord's Prayer is. 9 through 13. 9 through 13, thank you. Thank you. I forgot the verses. But when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received the reward, their reward in full. Can you skip to nine, I think? Mm -hmm. Verse nine. Yeah. Thank you. In this manner, yeah. therefore, pray. Read it. It's hard for me to say okay. this, this slide. Therefore, you should pray like this. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yeah. Now, in, there's a petition that says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Um, and, and, um, one rendering of the Greek is, is that, forgive us uh, in the way that we've already forgiven. Uh, another way of interpreting that is, forgive us in proportion to which we're prepared to forgive others. So if we're harboring unforgiveness in our heart and bitterness, that's a dangerous prayer. Yeah. Well, Jesus uh, puts a, an exclamation mark on that, in that at the end of the Lord's Prayer, he continues and says, For if you forgive others, offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Ouch. That's a big ouch. Ouch. Huge. And so when I read that, I said, God, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that really is, is not cool. But then as I meditated on that further, he wouldn't ask us to do that if he didn't give us the grace and the capacity to do that. Amen. And, and so and if we don't, we you're going to say this, but we don't, we're not going to get peace. We're not going to get what we're supposed to get if we don't forgive it. It's, mm -hmm. We're hurting us. Yeah. Well, we're on the hook, really. Yeah. I remember one time I was so ticked off with this guy, and uh, we later had a chance to talk about it. He had no idea that he hurt me. And here I was going, Arr! and I'm going to hold this grudge so he'll suffer. Well, yeah. guess who was suffering? <laughs> Yeah. You know, so um, uh, these are principles that, that God has laid out for us. I mean, the whole purpose of Jesus coming to earth was to, to reconcile us. And, you know, the last word he said from the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. That's right. And so this is central to the gospel. And, and so I really believe that it is accessible to us. Um, one of the big problems in Eastern Canada that we have uh, is that people feel that they have a right to take offense. And, and so many people in leadership, in the church even, and I said, we have no right to hold grudges. We, we really, we need to let these go. And there is grace, there's help. God will help us to, to forgive. So, um, I'll give you the heads up. Yeah, no, no, I just, I'm just, I'm just checking. <laughs> so I don't want to move into a time of prayer. And that uh, the Lord would help us. Um, uh, 
maybe I should do a quick check. Uh, have, has any of you ever been hurt by somebody? Uh, I guess I got the right crowd here. Uh, now, this is the kicker. Have any of you ever been hurt by somebody in the church or by another believer or by a pastor? Oh, wow. Isn't that something? You know, those things should happen, but they do. It's like we're human. Well, we are human. But God calls us to a higher standard in, in that way. And he gives us the grace to, to live into that. And there's nothing more powerful. I mean, I was dumbfounded uh, around that relationship with Father David. You know, there had been such hurt. Uh, and, and my whole ordination was at, 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 at risk. And, uh, you know, feeling called. And all the years I'd spent in seminary, just, I thought, those are going to just go right out the window. You know? And there was a lot at stake. And God redeemed that. And uh, I'm very thankful. So again, I want to invite you to turn your hands downward. And as I mentioned to you before, uh, many times this is a process, but this might just be a beginning for you to recognize uh, places where you've experienced hurt. And uh, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to ask the Lord to show us uh, specific situations or particular people, and uh, and then uh, I want to invite you to let them go, uh, let God deal with them. In fact, God knows how to deal with people's hearts way more than we do. Uh, when we let these things go, stuff gets uncluttered, and God begins to really deal with people. I've seen that happen. It's amazing. Uh, so. Uh, Unforgiveness sort of comes up the, the works for God working in our lives and in other people's lives. So, and then I'll ask you to turn your hands up. And my simple prayer at that point is, Lord, we need you to heal our hearts. We've been hurt. We've been banged around. And um, uh, we want to ask that you would come and, and begin to minister to us. And as I say, this is a process. Some people have experienced profound betrayal. That's why I love that passage in Hebrews. Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll never betray you. You know, what a promise. And so, uh, uh, to ask him to begin this. And, and again, I want to encourage you that if this is touching upon something, um, there's various kinds of abuse in a group this size. I'm sure there, there are several people that have uh, had to endure uh, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, uh, you've had to endure even sexual abuse, um, various expressions of abuse, which are very, very painful and really speaks and touches the core of who we are. And so I don't expect a magic formula that this, you know, to do this exercise and everything's going to be fine, but it's a start. And so I want to invite you to be courageous and begin to let people go who have caused hurt, situations that have caused hurt, and, um, and that the Lord would uh, initiate or continue a uh, healing process. And if this is something that is, is touching you uh, profoundly, uh, find someone that is safe, that can walk with you through this, because God desires that we're whole and we're healed. And so, Lord, as we turn our hands downward, I ask that you would show us uh, situations and individuals that have hurt us. And uh, for some of us, it's easy to remember. Others, you might be just reminding us something that happened to a teacher that uh, spoke and embarrassed us in front of our class. Um, various things like that from childhood that we've so, even sort of forgotten. But you haven't forgotten, Lord, because you want to heal our hearts. You want to restore us and make us whole. And so I ask that you would give us the ability to uh, to do that releasing, to pray that prayer, Lord, I choose to give this person a gift they don't deserve. I choose to forgive them so I can get off the hook. Many times 
sometimes these things strike very deeply, so often there's tears, and that's okay. This is a safe place. It's a place where we're coming together to be with the Lord. So just allow that to come. As you turn your hands upward, you say, Lord, would you heal my heart? Would you bring comfort to me? Would you wrap your arms around me? I've been deeply, deeply hurt. I've been betrayed. I've been maligned. I've been lied about. I've been violated. So Lord, would you touch my heart? Would you heal my heart? Would you wrap your arms around me and bring comfort to me? You know, if we can get a hold of this, it's life-changing. Most of us have heard of Martin Luther King Jr. He saw five youth, black youth, shot in the back by U.S. Marshals. Talk about an abuse of power. And he was committed to nonviolent um, resistance. And, um, but because of that type of civil disobedience, uh, he was thrown in jail. And he was just seething, just beside himself. How did this happen that these young lives would be stuffed out by people in authority who would, should know better? And, and they weren't even charged with murder. They were just cold-blooded murder. And he had a visitation in his cell. And the Lord appeared to him and said, My son, you must forgive them. And God gave him grace to forgive those U.S. Marshals. And that's when he became dangerous. And they killed him. He was a prophet of God. And there's nothing more dangerous than a healed prophet speaking truth, speaking Father's heart. And there are many people in this room, especially you young people, who will speak truth to your generation. And uh, stuff will get flung at you. All kinds of, pardon my language, all sorts of crap will come in your direction. Jesus said, blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness sake. He didn't say if you're persecuted, it's, 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 it's when. You know. In my first parish, I'm very different from my peers. And uh, I, I shared my story, my journey with, with some of my friends, and they said, John, you've been actively persecuted. And, uh, and I said, well, I've been, I ministered in the underground church in China. That was, that was a trip, that was an experience. Yeah. Uh, they know what real persecution is. I've had a few momentary afflictions. But in my first parish, when this started to happen, when, when other clergy started writing letters to the bishop and things and, and speaking ill of me, the Lord said this to me. He said, I want you better, not bitter. And I'm like, ooh, I'm going to hang on to that one. Yeah. And he's given me grace to do that, to remain, to keep in that place of joy, in that place of peace. I mean, even my wife calls me Mellow John, you know. Um, one of my prayers is, Lord, make me like Ronald Reagan. Uh, they called him the Teflon Man. Nothing stuck. You know, any controversies and things would just hit him and just fall to the ground. I said, let me be like that too, when people speak words that are, uh, are death words. Let them just fall to the ground. Yeah. And, uh, and he will give us grace to do that, that in the midst of, and you probably have encountered missionaries that have come back from just dire circumstances, and they're radiant. Jesus is living in them, and his life and his light is 
flowing through them. And they've learned the key. They've learned to forgive. They've learned to walk in the light of the Lord and, and trust Him in the midst of really challenging circumstances. So I offer this to you, yes. I trust as a gift that will uh, help you through your life. Because you will <laughs> run into people who don't understand you and who don't like you. That was a big deal for me. Oh boy. Because I liked everybody to like me. But this has been a key for me to understand and to take hold of the kindness of God. The goodness of God. His desire for healing and reconciliation. This is his deal. And we have the privilege of entering into that with him. With his help. to be able to live into that. Bless you.